2.0, which was about 20 years ago, uh, when, when, when web pages were first painted on cave walls. Uh, I've been involved with WordPress since I developed my first plugin back in 2007. Uh, my main contribution was sort of core. I was the developer for the NPC Latino news site on the WordPress PWP platform. Um, over the years, I've worked at SGU's, E-Trade, Stanford, Georgetown, University of Pennsylvania, WebDev Studios, and others. Um, most of my career has been as a developer, but I've also done, <coughs> also done a good deal of project management, team management, um, and I'm a big believer in agile and lean practices. Um, I'm also a new resident of the Boston area. This is what my house looks like. Uh, I took this picture three days ago. Uh, it looks pretty much the same today. Uh, I moved here from Philadelphia, where I worked at a consulting shop called Promptworks. Um, and a lot of the material in this talk comes from my experience there as a 15-person uh, web application consultancy. Um, and in the two years I've been in business, they've signed over 30 time and materials contracts. And I'll be talking to you today about time and materials contracts as opposed to fixed scope, uh, fixed price contracts. Um, uh, since coming to Boston, I've started my own uh, consulting uh, business with a friend of mine. He's the uh, president of IMD CTO. We have fancy titles. Um, and uh, I was an act. My slides are just as I'm just trying to solve that. There we go. Um, I was an active member of the WordPress community in Philadelphia. And I look forward to becoming part of the community here in Boston. Um, a disclaimer, um, I'm not your lawyer, I'm not a lawyer at all, um, nothing you may take from this presentation should be considered legal advice, I'm here to give you business advice and not recommend specific language for your contracts, so really the takeaway from this is that if you copy something down from one of my slides and put it in a contract and somebody sues you, please don't sue me. Um, so agenda, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean when I use the word agile. Uh, it's important to cover that. Um, I'm also going to talk a lot about professionalism and what it means to have a professional relationship with your client because that relationship is really what underlies having a, a good contract. Um, uh, so, let's dive right into Agile. Um, so, it would take me really a whole presentation, um, a long presentation, to explain all of the aspects of, of what Agile is. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to do that, um, but it's important that I explain the beliefs and values that motivate some of these practices. Um, so back in 2001, a group of 17 very experienced software developers got together and came up with this, the Agile Manifesto. Um, they spent their careers struggling with the all-too-common pattern the software projects that they would be late, they would go over budget, quality would suffer as people rushed to meet big deadlines, um, and customers and developers would end up frustrated. Um, one of the key problems they saw were these big plans that were flexible, which meant opportunities were missed for feedback, for learning, for adapting to change. Um, another key problem they saw was a lack of strong partnership with their customers. Energy would often go into lengthy contract negotiations instead of working together to get things done. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, when you're working with a traditional fixed price, fixed scope contract, um, you're taking the approach uh, shown here on the left. Um, and the idea is that with enough detailed planning, you can correctly understand and estimate all the specifics of a project and deliver it on time and on budget. Um, as everyone in this room probably knows, with software, this is really hard. Because uh, every project is different, and experience has shown uh, through the, throughout the industry that there are always unknowns that you will encounter no matter how much you plan. And the fast pace of business often requires changes to the plan. So when you're you know, trying to estimate a project, you have some experience, you know uh, about these issues, so you deliberately sort of overestimate um, to cover those unknowns. Um, but you can't overestimate by too much because you don't want to lose a bit. Um, you don't want to overestimate by too little because you want to actually make some money. Um, so um, instead, with the, the Agile approach, um, shown on the other side here, you intend Instead, treat the project as a series of small experiments where you work together with your client, learning from those experiments, incrementally delivering features, and building towards uh, uh, solving your client's problems. Um, so I just use the word incremental. Let me go into that a little bit more. Um, in the Agile development approach, you focus on developing in small incremental steps through repeated iterative cycles. 
So when we build incrementally, we're basically taking a chunk at a time, building that piece, uh, getting in front of our clients, getting feedback. Um, when we build it in an iterative way, we're starting with kind of a vague idea, slowly fleshing out the details. So you're kind of going back and forth and sort of taking both these approaches at the same time. Um, but really the idea is to focus on developing one feature at a time, starting with the features that have the most business value to your customer. With each feature, you start with the simplest thing that could possibly work. Um, get feedback and continue refining until it's good enough. Um, so to give you an example um, from this NBC Latino project I worked on, since this is a new site, you know, new sites often have like big images or image carousels on the front page. They wanted one of these. And when we initially sort of looked at the project, we're like, oh, no big deal, image carousel, plenty of plugins, we'll just do that. Um, so we started with something really simple. We showed it to them. Um, and then when they saw it, at first I thought that's all they needed, but then when they saw it, they're like, oh, well, you know, we can't always guarantee our images are going to have the same aspect ratio. Some will be taller, some will be wider. Um, they thought maybe they wanted some automatic cropping, but then people's heads get chopped off on the pictures. So then they thought, well, maybe we just want to automatically scale it. Um, then things you end up with, you know, sort of black bars on the tops or the sides. So this ended up becoming much more involved. Um, and that's okay uh, when you're doing it in an agile way because the client identified this as something and they were willing to, you know, answer that difficult question of, you know, do we spend less time on other features to save the budget, or do we spend more money and work on this um, and still do everything else that you want? So as long as you're having those conversations, um, take this approach and give the clients what they need. Um, so I'll have a little more about to say, to say about this in a little bit. Um, but I want to at least get the basic concept out there. There's a lot more to Agile than just this, but this is kind of the key concept that uh, informs what I'm going to be talking about when we get into the contracts. Um, so, the um, question is how do you successfully negotiate a contract that will support this open-ended, agile approach? Um, before I can really answer that, I need to talk about uh, professionalism, what it means to form a professional relationship with their client. Um, this relationship is crucial to how you approach negotiating a contract and how you work with your client once the project is underway. Um, and to do this, I'm going to talk about some experiences I've had um, in Japan. Um, if you're familiar at all with Agile or Lean practices, you may have heard words like Kaizen and Kanban. These come from Japanese culture and Japanese business practices that have been brought in to a lot of how we do software development now. Um, I've lived in Japan uh, for two six-month periods. I've been there to visit probably another half dozen times. I'm fascinated by the culture. Spent a lot of time trying to sort of understand it and, and learn it. Um, and if you've ever been to Japan or you're thinking about going, um, a hallmark of Japanese culture is a consistent level of politeness, kindness, and excellent service you will receive pretty much anywhere you go. Um, this was uh, described well by a columnist uh, who wrote about it on uh, Forbes.com, and she said, Wherever I ventured, stores large or small, I experienced what would be considered white glove service back home delivered with a kind of warmth, enthusiasm, and salesmanship typically found in black and white movies. Um, another way to put it is uh, from the CEO of Uniqlo, which is a large clothing retailer in Japan, sort of like uh, The Gap. Um, and he said, there is customer service, and then there is Japanese customer service. Um, to give you an idea of what this means, uh, when Uniqlo opened their first store outside of, the, uh, outside of Japan, which was in uh, Melbourne, Australia, they spent a full year training the Australian staff to get them up to what they felt was a Japanese level of quality service. So imagine going through a year of training before you can work the floor the gap. Um, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Um, to give you sort of a more personal idea of what I'm talking about, um, to go to a department store in Japan when it first opens in the morning and there's really nobody there. Um, I did this once really by accident. I didn't realize the hours and I just happened to get there when it opened up. Um, as I walk through the store, they have people, you know, working at sort of each section of, of the store and the different, um, different types of clothing and, and that sort of thing. So there'd be somebody pretty much every 20 or 30 feet. Um, since there's no one in the store yet, there's nothing for them to do, so they stand by the aisle and they stand there, um, you know, it's almost like they're on guard or something. Um, and as you walk through, they'll bow to you as you walk by, it's sort of like, the waves parting before you. Um, so, oh, you sort of feel like you're royalty or something. Um, and then as you're shopping for something or asking questions, if anything goes even slightly wrong, the people helping you will be profusely apologetic and work to address the situation as quickly as possible. When you leave the store after making a purchase, the person
an effort to engage people socially, you may be surprised at the warmth of the interactions you'll have. Um, and it's typical as you go through Japan, go into different stores, to see a Japanese worker perform the lowliest job as if it were the best. Um, and my favorite example of this is the cashiers. Um, so even in something like a 7-Eleven, or a bakery or wherever, um, you pay for something and they go to give you your change. And I feel like I'm at, at Vegas at like a blackjack table. You know, they'll fan out the money or snap the bills, um, hand it to you, um, wait till you put it away, then they give you your, your coins. Um, so it's like, oh, I'm getting change. Um, all these little ordinary things become sort of fun experiences and you feel like they're being treated really well. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is so different in Japan than it is here. People take pride in their work, and uh, they're treated with respect by everyone and pay a living wage. Um, the culture also emphasizes the interests of the collective group over individual interests, which is very different from our culture. There's some downsides to that, but in terms of customer service, it's, it's a very nice thing. Um, so from everything I've just told you, um, you may come away thinking, in Japan, the customer is king. Um, and that's because as Westerners, we typically perceive this behavior as a selfless devotion to the customers. The Japanese workers will do anything to please you since you were made to feel so well taken care of. Um, but that's not what's actually really going on. Um, this perception is a result of our own Western cultural assumptions, where we presume a sort of hierarchical relationship. Um, the Latin roots of the word service and servant are serve us. Um, this is also in Latin happens to be the same word for slave. Um, so that's sort of the cultural roots of our ideas of, of service. Um, we've come a long way since then, but those notions are still there. Um, the Japanese concept of service has a different cultural context. Um, and of course, there's a word for it, uh, omo tanashi. It has two different literal translations. One is single-hearted, the other is achieve. It's a combination of these meanings that defines the Japanese concepts of service and hospitality. It's about anticipating your customer's needs and proactively meeting them. You and your customer each have a role to play, and you are equals. So how you behave as a customer in Japan is actually different from how we behave here. As a customer, you never took waiters, taxi drivers, or anyone else. You're not even expected to say thank you. And to me, that's really weird. I'd see people like go up to the counter, take whatever it is, and just walk back. <laughs> But that's the role of the customer. They are there to be taken care of. Um, but as a customer, you are expected to respect the professional judgment of your service provider and respect your expertise. Um, so if you ask someone providing a service, have a customer who's really pressing you for something, it means something's gone wrong. It could mean you're not doing your job well. Um, or it could mean the customer has overstepped the bounds of their role. Um, maybe they don't realize it or don't fully understand the ramifications of what they're asking for. And for the sake of the customer actually having a good experience, and for the sake of your reputation, you have a responsibility to not be pushed into behaving unprofessionally. Uh, in this kind of situation, a Japanese service provider will still be incredibly polite, will patiently try to educate you, and will resist doing the wrong thing with steely resolve. Um, so I was a little hesitant 
sugar on your apron, and you're going to get home and give it to your wife or whatever, and she's going to say, wow, the people at the store did a really lousy job. Um, so they're thinking about that, not just what you asked for, they're thinking about their reputation and the actual quality of your experience, even if you're not thinking about it. Um, so I'll give you another example. This is a story my wife told me she went to buy something uh, for a, a friend's daughter. It was a present, and um, the person selling it to her asked if it was a present. She made a mistake of saying yes, um, because then they do this very collaborative gift wrapping. But my wife was in a hurry, and she didn't want them to do it. Um, and it became this sort of like test of wills. But my wife, was, she looks Japanese, because she's ethnically Japanese, but she's American. So culturally, she's not on the same page as the, the, the people providing the service. So the person's like, you know, put it in a nice bag, put a bow on it, and <laughs> just like see where my wife will make her stop, you know. Um, so there was a sort of test of wills around it. Um, so why am I telling you all this? What does any of this have to do with working with clients on web projects? So let's take those examples I've told you and come up with some parallels for, for web projects. I'll start with some easy ones and progress to some more sort of challenging situations. Um, so one was when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, we had a department that came in for one of the regular meetings and they said, well, we're going to block. Um, now one way to respond to that would be say, okay, you know, should we, let's talk about features of WordPress, let's talk about features of maybe other blogging platforms, you know, what kind of things you want to do, and just sort of dive right in and just start building the whole blog. Um, but we didn't do that, instead we asked a different question, we asked, well, why? Why do you want to block them? What are you going to do with it? Um, and it turns out they didn't really know. Um, it, really, they just sort of knew the word blog had something to do with communicating with uh, their students and it seemed to them, based on their limited knowledge, that this was what they wanted. Um, after we really talked it through, which took a while, they actually wanted something completely different. They wanted like a discussion forum where prospective students could connect with existing students to learn what it was like to, to be a student. So, asking these kinds of questions, not just assuming that what your customer is saying they want is what they really want. Um, so that's kind of an easy example. There wasn't a lot of challenge in there or anything in terms of like pushback. Um, just a little bit of a harder example. Uh, another project that I worked on was for a client that provided um, energy efficiency services for buildings. Um, you know, if you had insulation to these walls, you'll save X amount of dollars if you buy energy appliances, you'll save Y amount of dollars. Um, you know, these, and they wanted to demonstrate that value in their in their website um, by taking inputs from their users and being able to show specifically what their savings would be. Um, and they had come up with their own way of calculating these savings. And um, you know, uh, we looked at them, we thought, well, maybe these aren't really the best predictors. Like, we didn't have a lot of data to show that, but we just had sort of a bad feeling about it. Um, so we kind of went back to them express these concerns and express sort of an alternative. And they're like, no, don't do it that way. We just do it our way. We know what we're doing. Um, so we did the thing where instead of um, asking for permission, we asked for forgiveness and went off and did our own little thing where we did some statistical analysis. Because they had given us data of what the actual savings were from some of the previous clients. So we had some data work with and came up with a statistical model rather than the sort of hunch-based model that they had. Um, and we showed it to them. Did it on our own time just for an hour to throw something together and said, Look, you know, I think we were able to better predict with our model the uh, real savings your customers had. We did better than yours. <laughs> so then they were like, oh, Okay, you know, they saw that and thought it was good and, and went with it. So a little more pushback there, but we kind of went ahead with what we thought was the better thing and showed it to them. And we were able to demonstrate the value. Um, so I'll give you a third and final one. 
into this funnel so that they'll you know, do the behaviors that you want and, and make the purchases. Um, and they're like, well, we don't want to change it. You know, uh, we just spent all this money. Um, so that's when we had to like be really honest and push back. You know, the, the other way to go would have been just say, well, okay, we'll fix these few little things that are broken and sort of get you over that finish line. You know, um, but we didn't do that. Um, so we pushed back. And we're like, no, like, this is, you guys are clearly still figuring out your identity based on what we're hearing in this conversation. You still haven't totally figured out some of the things you want to do. We need to consult with you on your identity and your goals and then build the right thing. Um, so we came out of that meeting feeling like we're not going to get this. Um, but then when they came back to us, they're like, you know, you were totally different from the other vendors we talked to. Um, and they respected the fact that, you know, we weren't going to just go along with what they said they wanted to do. We really saw what they what we saw what, we, uh, what their challenges were and pushed to solve those rather than just do some quickie solution that really wasn't going to get them where they needed to go. Um, so really your takeaway from everything I'm saying is that, you know, uh, be confident in what you think is the right thing to do that you have a lot of experience that your clients don't have and they may often say what they think they want but they often don't really know if you can demonstrate um, a better idea and why it's better um, you'll be often surprised at how much people will respect that and respond to it um, so let's talk a little more about contracts um, so a traditional fixed scope fixed price contract typically implies a sort of typical western style hierarchical relationship with you and your client. Um, I don't know if all of you have seen this. If you haven't, this is called the project management triangle. Um, and the idea is that every project is governed by its schedule, its cost, and its scope. Um, and uh, the simple way to think about this is clients want things for free. They want it now, and they want it perfect. Um, and obviously, you can't provide that. Um, so they will try to and it's in their interest. They will try to sort of squeeze all three sides of this triangle to get the scope, all the features, uh, the price that they want, and the schedule that they want. And they'll want all that in the contract. Um, so this puts you in a very difficult position for multiple reasons. The key one is that you're at the beginning of the project, you're still learning about it, um, and you're asked to give an estimate. Um, and you don't have a lot of time to give that estimate. So at the time you know the least about what you have to do, you're having to make this big commitment. Um, and this is putting most of the risk and responsibility on you. It's really not a relationship of equal partners. Um, another sort of good analogy for this is from Ron Jeffries, one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto. Um, so if you go to the store with a huge shopping list of $20, you need the authority to go to the money machine for more cash or the authority to make changes to the list. Um, this sounds pretty obvious when you put it this way, but so much tension that goes into negotiating contracts is really about this simple um, and what's happening in these negotiations is this sort of mismatch between authority and responsibility. What's happening is the client is trying to retain authority on the project and sort of give you the responsibility. Um, but ultimately, for the project to be successful, for both you and the client to be happy, responsibility and authority need to be brought into more alignment and shared. Um, if you don't, things almost always start to go wrong partway through the project, and when that happens, you don't want to end up like this guy. Um, so you're thinking, okay, I don't want to go that route. You want to take an Agile approach. And maybe you've actually gone and learned a lot about Agile already. Maybe you're experienced with it. Maybe you're an Agile Jedi. Um, you know, the Agile Manifesto values collaboration over contract negotiation. Um, but if your potential client has not worked in an Agile way before, um, you know, you talk, so you talk to them about adapting to change, about working in short iterations, and deliver functioning features things like velocity to track progress, you know, all this great stuff. Um, but it's not enough. Um, even if your potential client likes what you're saying, you're asking them to take a leap of faith into something they don't really fully understand yet. So it sounds risky, and they and their lawyers don't like risk. Um, so you need to explain the benefits of taking an agile approach and not using a fixed price, fixed scope contract. Um, you need to do this in concrete terms they will find persuasive. Um, so a good way to do that is to examine the assumptions that go into these traditional contracts. Um, and clients have a natural preference uh, for fixed price, fixed scope contracts. They're familiar with them. 
They spell out what will be delivered, when, and for how much. And at first glance, they appear to protect the client from risk and put the risk on the contractor. Um, so a good starting point is to highlight the misplaced assumptions and expectations um, your client may have about these contracts. Um, and a key thing really is that they assume what's called a traditional sort of waterfall development process um, where software development is treated like a construction project where you, you know, um, plan everything out and then you start building and then after you build everything you start testing, you know, sort of these long cycles. Um, so one uh, assumption of these traditional contracts are these long lead times, that there's a long delay between the start of the project and the delivery of useful products. Um, that opportunities for feedback are limited. Um, that if there's any opportunity for feedback at all, it's going to be late in the project and can't play a large role in shaping the deliverables. Um, payments will be infrequent and large, um, and don't basically only happen when major milestones are achieved. This can raise the pressure and anxiety for both parties around these milestones. Um, also, if the project were to end early, um, that could only mean the project has failed. Um, so if the project was scheduled for six months and the contract was terminated after four months, that could only mean something has gone disastrously wrong you know, when you're looking at it through this traditional approach. Um, so all of these assumptions are invalid in an Agile project because an Agile approach instead assumes a highly variable sort of research and development type process. <laughs> um, so a key part of this is that we have frequent delivery of working software. Um, we're working iteratively, working incrementally. Um, we could potentially launch early. So this idea of ending early can only be bad. In the Agile world, ending early could be good. Um, it means you have met the needs sooner than expected. So let's launch. Why wait? Um, so um, the customer can realize value at regular intervals. It can mean you as a contractor can get paid at regular intervals. Um, it mitigates risk and liability for both parties because you are delivering working software maybe every week or every two weeks or giving them functioning, usable software. Um, one more thing about that. So everything I just said on this slide, um, it assumes a contractor has a mature discipline development process. You actually have to be able to do the things that I'm talking about here. That you can deliver complete tested features and source cycles. It also means that your client has to stay strongly engaged in the project throughout its life cycle. They have to be working with you. Since you're working in these short and intense cycles, they have to be doing it too. Because um, if you're going to uh, get their feedback and uh, incorporate that feedback into the work, they need to be uh, engaged pretty much constantly. Um, another key aspect is that adapting to change decreases risk. Um, because we're getting that feedback frequently, um, the traditional approach, in contrast, uh, obligates delivery of the original set of requirements and requests for change can only add time and cost, so we get away from that. Um, and in fact, the fixed price, fixed slope contracts actually increase risk and cost, and really lack of frequent feedback is the root cause of that. Um, part of what I'm presenting here is uh, uh, from a chapter in a book called Agile Con The Agile Contracts Primer. If you Google it, it'll come right up. Um, and they have this footnote in there that is awesome. I don't know why they stuck it in a footnote, but they talk about this example of an offshore outsourcing company in India. Um, and they had learned to gain the system of fixed price, fixed scope contracts. They knew from experience that the contracts requirements would not end up meeting the customer's actual needs. Um, and so they looked forward to what they called the ongoing rent of, uh, of the work they were asked to do after the contract was complete to evolve the unsatisfactory system that they built to meet the true needs. Um, so this approach can actually increase risk and costs rather than protect clients from it. Um, so this slide here is your takeaway slide if you want to uh, quote or one thing to remember. Um, it's this one. Agile contract is more in agreement about a collaboration process and less about deliverables. Um, the fixed price, fixed scope contracts can encourage an adversarial mind mindset. They require you know, the big design up front approach, which means all the particulars need to be negotiated in detail up front. And this pushes worry about risk to the forefront and who is bearing that risk. An agile contract instead focuses.
focus is on having an agreement about how we will work together to deliver a successful project. This gets us much closer to this Omotenashi kind of relationship I was talking about from my experience in Japan. Um, so let's dive into what these contracts actually look like. What goes into an ANVIL contract? Um, there's a project proposal, a master services agreement, and a scope of work. Um, the project proposal makes a case for why the client should choose you and describes the project at a high level. Um, if the client likes the proposal, you can move on to the MSA and the scope of work. Um, the MSA is the legalese document that talks about liability and warranties and those sorts of things. And the scope of work is the agreement describing the work for the project. Um, so our project proposals um, typically run 10 or 11 pages and they have these sections in them. I'm not going to go through every section because you're all falling asleep. Um, but some things to highlight. Um, first, of course, we make the case for why they should hire us, our depth and breadth of experience, the quality of our work and our technical practices, and we tell them about who some of our other awesome clients are. Um, we make the case for an agile approach, including emphasizing the importance of their being strongly engaged in the project throughout its life cycle. Um, something we do that I often don't see in other project proposals is the risks section. We have a section that highlight, highlights risks we see that can affect the quality, timeliness, or cost of the project. So an example might be a requirement that we you know, um, have to have our projects uh, interact with some internal API you know, that we haven't seen. We don't know how easy or hard it is to work with this thing. We will highlight that as a risk um, in the project, so that's front and center for everybody to see. Um, our deliverable section is actually really short. In a traditional contract, that would be very long. Uh, we say we will deliver source, source code. We will deliver automated tests. We talk about browser compatibility and deployment. And that's pretty much it. Um, so um, there are many possible types of contracts. Um, a person named Peter Stevens wrote a good overview of the different types. And these are all the different types he's talked about um, in his article. Um, I'll post my slides online. The, the heading there is a link for it. Um, uh, uh, given the constraints of time, I'm really just going to focus on time and materials. Um, and that's what we make the case for in our project proposals. Um, we use them because they're simple, easy to understand, easy to build, and provide the flexibility needed for running an Agile project. Um, uh, when I was at PromptWorks, in the two years I was there, they signed over 30 time and materials contracts. Um, uh, my, my own consulting company now, Loki Oki Design, we're just starting, uh, but we've already signed three so far in our first two months of business. Um, so our time and materials approach. Um, first thing you have to do is provide a ballpark project estimate based on initial requirements. Now this is not the same as the big design up front, you know, uh, traditional fixed scope approach, but you've got to give your client something. You can't just say, oh, we'll just work on it until it's done. Like, they have a budget, they have a schedule. Um, you, you do have to provide some information about that. Um, so we make clear it's a non-binding estimate based on our initial understanding of the requirements. Um, and you will ask them to provide whatever they have. Sometimes it's just something in an email or maybe they have an internal document. Um, but you know, we'll get as much detail as they can provide in a you know, relatively short period of time. If it's a small project, this estimate can take us just an hour or two. A large one, we'll spend maybe a day on it because remember this is not time. You're getting paid for it. Um, uh, my experience has been it's always good to involve at least two people in this estimating because um, you'll both you know, bring different sets of experience to it, have different ideas about how something might be built, so you can have a conversation about that and, and come up with a better set of numbers. Um, and sometimes, especially for larger projects, you may need to do a second round of estimating where you sort of uh, give your client uh, your, your first one, that'll spark some thoughts from them, they'll have some feedback. Um, and you may need to do a second round, but again, this is something to spend, you know, out really measuring your time here in hours, not days or weeks, um, with this estimating, uh, initial ballpark estimating. Um, we'll do an initial prioritization if the client has already has not already provided one um, to help us understand sort of what you would work on first, what you would work on second, and so forth. Um, we'll give them a dedicated team. This is another important aspect of the Agile approach that you don't have, you know, one person splitting their time between half a dozen different projects. Um, the costs, the mental costs, and time costs of task switching are very high. Most of you have probably experienced this where you're sort of going deep on something and all of a sudden you're asked to do something else. Um, there's a lot of lost sort of mental cycles and time and that sort of task switching. Um, having a dedicated team can also increase your client's confidence that, you know, these are my people, they're going to be working on 
accomplished project for me. It's not just some faceless organization out there that's doing the work. Um, we deliver working features weekly. Every week we'll have something new to show so the client can get their feedback. Um, we bill monthly for developer weeks. Um, so the, the rate really is hourly, but again, to keep things simple, if we've got a full-time dedicated team, we'll do developer weeks. If it's a really small project, maybe we'll just do hourly, but bigger project, we bill it at sort of the week level. Um, and we work continuously with the client to evolve and prioritize features. So what that initial set of requirements <coughs> of look like in the first week, it could look pretty different a few weeks later because we're working constantly with the client to refine it. Um, so, um, and then uh, finally, uh, we stop when it makes sense. So, the client says this is good enough, let's launch, maybe we'll keep adding features after that. Um, but again, having something sort of ready to go, this idea that if we had to launch at the end of this week, we can do it. Every time we deliver a set of features, they are ready to go. So, we do all this, and about half the time, 50% of our prospective clients uh, who we get this far with, um, they raise concerns. And they want to know, how do, we, how do I know we'll stay on budget? How do I know we'll stay on schedule? Um, these are trust and confidence questions. Building trust is key to an agile approach. If you don't succeed in building trust, that doesn't bode well for the project, regardless of the type of contract. Um, so how do you respond to these? Um, First thing you can do is, of course, this is actually really important, is provide references. You know, if your client has ever seen an Agile approach before, um, they'll want to talk to somebody who's done this with you before and help them build their confidence that this works, can work really well. Um, reiterate the Agile advantages. You know, they're in the project proposal. Sometimes people don't read them closely. Sometimes you don't have time to explain everything. But just remind them we work closely with you to prioritize features. So the most important parts of your application are built first and your budget will go to the most important aspects first. And we'll actually want to have a staging site or maybe even a live site before your launch date and use test users, get some real people using your system and giving us feedback. Um, another thing you can do if, they're, if they really are sensitive to cost and have a really fixed budget ceiling is you can include a not to exceed clause. Uh, and you have to be careful in explaining this that it's not that fixed scope agreement where you're saying, yes, we will provide everything for this price, you are instead saying, we will not go above this price without talking to you first. If we're getting close to it, we will sit down and have a conversation um, and see where we are. Um, and we'll keep an eye on that as we work uh, throughout the project. Um, we remind them that uh, in our proposals, uh, we have a 30-day cancellation option for both them and us. Van, them and us. Uh, either party can cancel at any time with 30 days notice. Um, we do test-driven development. Um, which means our, our code is portable to other contractors. So um, if they're unhappy at some point in the, of the project, they can take the code. It has tests that demonstrate all the code functions and serves as documentation for the code. They can take it to someone else. Um, so we go through all that. We still lose about 25%. Um, and that's OK. You're not going to get every client. Um, and there are often multiple reasons uh, why we don't get them. Sometimes our price is just too high. Um, sometimes they face insurmountable bureaucratic obstacles to accepting a time and materials contract. This can happen at large organizations where it's just sort of bureaucratically mandated that your contracts have to look a certain way. Um, but then often, sometimes we just can't win them over. Um, Sometimes they prefer the lower level of day-to-day -day client engagement that's typical with the fixed price, fixed scope contracts, where they spell everything out and then they just sort of disappear on you. Um, some still remain attached to the feeling uh, of security and familiarity that goes with the traditional contracts. Um, so here's an example from an email from a real client that turns down, um, saying, I really appreciate your interest in our project and the time you and your team put into the proposals of the costs and open-ended structure just don't work for this project. I'll certainly keep prompt works in mind for the future, particularly if we've got a project that would benefit more from the cooperative slash iterative design process that you've proposed. Um, so the 
the story behind this one is interesting because the project we were asked to do uh, was uh, in a, sorry, okay, thanks. Um, this was in a lab, um, and they had all these APIs they needed us to connect with. It was, it was sort of perfect for an agile approach where there's going to be a lot of ongoing discovery for the project. But what it really came down to was um, the price was too high, and they didn't, they, we could tell they really didn't want to have that day day engagement we were looking for to take an agile approach. Um, master services agreement. This is the legal ease document. These are the sections of our master services agreement. Um, some things to highlight. I want to get to the end here before I run out of time. Um, code ownership. I've been surprised at how many clients we've worked with who've had bad experiences with vendors before, and there was nothing in their previous contract that said that the client owned the code. Um, it's important to have it in the contract that the client owns the code. Um, that the previous uh, vendors who the relationship would go side sour, and the vendor would walk away with, with, with the project for the code. I mean, the code for the project. Um, it's important to let your client know that they own the code. Um, we highlight that the, uh, we will use open source code and that we don't warranty that code. Um, I think 10 years ago, this sort of thing used to be a concern. Now, this is more and more common, and you know, we can build our confidence and explain you know, how open source software powers so much of the internet, including WordPress itself. Um, we have in there the 30 days uh, notice to cancel by either party. Um, the services section, this is very short, we basically just say we are providing software development. Um, something to keep an eye out for if you are asked to sign a master services agreement from your client as opposed to using your own. Um, beware extreme requirements that can get in, in here. Uh, the most extreme one I've ever seen was from a uh, large media company that uh, we worked with, the PropWorks, that had a most favored nation clause that said, you know, if we were to offer a lower price to any other client, they would get that price. That's not so bad. We've seen that before. Um, but then they also said that that would be retroactive to all previous work, and we would need to refund them the difference. Um, so read the legal ease. There can be all kinds of things hidden in there. Um, scope of work. Keep it simple. Um, this is what a prompt works one looks like. Um, it's really very brief. Um, it basically is saying we will provide a, uh, developers for software development and consulting services. The deliverables are just rare, usually one sentence explanation of the project, and that we will provide tests uh, for the functionality. We say what the price is. Um, we lay out uh, uh, the timeline um, for the project. Um, but again, we're not guaranteeing a delivery date. Um, and then we say uh, who the project manager is on the client side. We want a dedicated person to work with um, uh, on the client side. We don't want to be talking to 20 different people uh, who all have different ideas about what the project should be. We want that single point of contact. Um, so, um, in our project proposals, we observe the traditional uh, big design upfront contracts of the developer and client at odds as each tries to bend ambiguity in the contractually specified features to their advantage. If uh, the big design estimate is too low, the developer can only absorb so much of the risk before calling it quits. So instead, we want to be our client's partner over the long term. We've learned the best way to align our interests and succeed together is to charge on a time and materials basis and cooperatively manage the risks inherent in all software projects. We bring our expertise in software development and agile practices, and we work together with our clients who bring their domain expertise, business requirements, and priorities. We work to respect each other's roles, and together, we do great things. <laughs>